Welcome back, socialites, for part two of The Real Miami Vice at Socialite Crime Club. Before we get into part two, let's do a recap just to make sure everybody's tracking. We have a dead body. This dead body was having an affair with the wife of a very rich mogul Mm -hmm. who hired, or at least it appears that he hired, this ragtag crew of MMA fighters to help him kill this poor victim. On the other side of the ring, we've got Crockett and Tubbs, our Miami Dade detectives, Mm -hmm. Doug and Chris, but we've nicknamed them Crockett and Tubbs after Miami Vice. And again, I really encourage people. And we also have Gail Levine. Gail the Bulldog Levine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we left off, there was a fingerprint found on the victim's vehicle. Initially, there was no return when that fingerprint was ran through the fingerprint system. Mm -hmm. But Crockett and Tubbs run it back through the system about six months later and they get a hit off of Gandula, who is now in Canada. And the issue with this is the extradition and how how do you go do an interview in Canada, number one? But what if this guy admits we can't extradite him? Like, how do we, how do we put this together? And you need a prosecutor. Another question. Are there other law enforcement in the room with the detectives and Gail in Canada while they're interviewing Gandula there? There is somebody else in the room. I'm not sure who it is. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably somebody affiliated with the local law enforcement there. Mm-hmm. If they're monitoring things that are being said because he is in Canada and he has other specific rights in Canada. Yeah. More important than that, I think it's if they were trying to arrest him in Canada, like they can talk all day long. It's when they physically try to go in custody that you could potentially have some problems. And you're going to see why it's so important to have a a prosecutor, an aggressive prosecutor who can actually make decisions. They fly to Canada. They sit down with Gandula, who agrees to meet with them, and they start the interview. And Gandula lies, just like he did the first time. That really not much involvement he had. Yeah, he's Mm -hmm. talked to him, but... He's training partners with Alexis the Exorcist. But it wasn't me. wasn't me. And then they confront him with the fingerprint, which changes everything. Mm. And this is when Gandula realizes, I'm in trouble. And Gandula's going to start to tell everything. So he's going to start with the real relationship that he has with everybody. So there is a gym in Miami called the Young Tigers. And it's a, a mixed martial art Muay Thai uh, gym that a lot of really talented people are coming out of. So the gym is legit. When he is fighting at the Young Tigers, so is Alexis the Exorcist, and that's where they meet. They're training partners, if you will. Not only are the two of them training partners, but they're also training partners with somebody by the name of Jorge Masvidal. Oh my gosh, okay. If you're not familiar with Jorge Masvidal, He is actually one of the UFC world champions. And I'll get into his history here in just a minute. But this is a picture of them at the Young Tigers. You can see the little tiger icon on the wall. Gandula is actually wearing the Young Tiger shorts there. But this is the three of them. Alexis, the the exorcist on the left. uh, Gandula on the right. And then that's Jorge Masvidal. They're all uh, in in very good shape, aren't they? It appears they might work out a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, They're probably not eating cake. No. The only bad part probably here is the combined IQ is probably 72. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) And Alexis looks really young there compared to the picture you showed us in the last episode. I think it's safe to say they've all significantly aged from this picture. They're all up and coming. They're just starting their careers at this point. Mm. Now, fast forward beyond this homicide. 
I don't know, 10, 15 years later, uh, late 19, I'm going to say 2018-ish, I'm watching UFC and this Jorge Masvidal, who I don't know from anybody else, is mm -hmm. apparently fighting. He's a big deal. He's fighting for the UFC champion. Yeah. And he's coming out to the ring and he's got this t-shirt on that says free Alexis Vila. Yes, he does. And I thought, wait a second, I have a case with an Alexis Vila. I wonder if it's the same. And sure enough, it's the same. Yeah. He, uh, he actually won this match. He won the UFC national title or the, the BMG champion belt, if you will. Mm -hmm. And his big thing for that fight was to free Alexis Vila. So he is very well known. He looks big in that picture. Yeah, uh, Much bigger than this picture here. Yes. Yeah, he, he bulked up a he little bit. He went up a few weight classes there. Yeah, he's probably just on a really healthy That or diet. it's his robe. Maybe yeah, his robe longer. makes him look a lot bigger. I I'm think that's sure. mink. Is that a mink fur around yeah, his yeah, I think so. collar there? Although he won this fight and he did really well, he was really an on or off fighter. He didn't have a really dominating history of fighting, but he did mm -hmm. have some very big fights that he won, such as this one. Okay. So he explains, he being Gandula, explains this connection between the three of them. And it all goes back to the young Tiger's gym because he's working out there one day, Vila comes in with Isaac. So just so everybody's tracking, Vila's the exorcist, Isaac's the thug, the, the uh, Latin Kings gang promoter. So the, the exorcist comes into the gym when Gandula is training there and he has the promoter with him and he introduces him to a Gandula. And basically this is just before all this murder happens. So it's probably early May. Alexis, the exorcist, is explaining there's a job that they need to do and it's for Manny Marin. Gandula will say that he overheard parts of this conversation and he knew that they were interested in hiring him for this job, but he thought it had something to do with the supermarket because Manny was really well known to give fighters these little side jobs to help them along while they're training. Mm -hmm. Everybody that Manny helps typically does really well. So Gandil is kind of excited, like, hey, I'm kind of, I'm getting in this circle, if you will. Sure. So that's how this whole thing starts with that piece. Gandula gets a call a few weeks later from Roberto Isaacs, the, uh, the promoter. Okay. That they're going to do this job. And he explains it really easily in the beginning. He just needs Gandula to go with him to get a check. Oh. Super simple. Okay. I'm going to pick you up. We're going to go get this check. I'm going to drop you off. You're going to make some quick cash. And Gandula's like, doogie. <laughs> <laughs> So Roberto <laughs> shows up one morning, calls him as he's getting to the apartment, and Gandula comes down and gets in the car, and they go to go cash this check. And Gandula does think it's a little weird when all of a sudden they're sitting on a side street doing surveillance at this guy's house. And, and this would be at Camilio's house. At Camilio's house. And it's this is the first time, according to Gandula, that Isaac admits he's been doing surveillance on this guy for a while. They watch Camilio come out with the three-week-old. They follow him to the wife's business. They watch him go into the business. They watch him come back, get the pacifier, go back into the business. When he comes back out getting ready to leave, they confront him. And at this point, the story has changed between Gandula and Isaac that, okay, we're not just take, getting a check. This guy owes money. Mm -hmm. We're going to... We're going to rough him up just a little bit to get paid. So did Gandula specify, because his fingerprints were on Camilio's car, did Camilio make it into his car before they approached him? No, he was just about to his car when they approached him, and they acted like Bell's bondsmen. Which... So he probably held the door closed and he wouldn't be able to get in oh, the car? Oh, no. Get this. There's a setup coming. He never made it to the car. Okay. They immediately contact him, and I think Camilio thought, like, okay, they're law enforcement or they're Bell's bonds or something, like it's just a mistake. Mm -hmm. But when they make contact, they immediately put his arms behind his back and zip time. Isaac at that point takes Camilio and puts him in the car, hands Camilio's keys to Gandula and tells Gandula, hey, go put those in his car. Aww. So Gandula goes over to the car, opens the door, puts the keys in there, shuts the door. And that's why his fingerprints are there. <sighs> I'm telling you, Gandula's the biggest victim, but he's just oh. a dope too. Like he, he does look a little, he's a little, a dopey. little slower. Yeah, he's just yeah. a dope. So from there, I'm sure he's a big teddy bear inside though. Yeah, what Gandula doesn't know at this point, because he doesn't know Isaac from anybody else, they're in a rental truck. Isaac rented a truck for this operation. Okay. So they go to Isaac's house, and Isaac, when he gets to the house, takes this guy that Gandula doesn't know that we now know as Camilio, takes him inside. Gandula stays with the truck. And at this point, he's thinking, this isn't what I signed up for. Something's seriously wrong here. So he starts calling Vila. So maybe I missed it. Where in the truck did they put Camilio? In in the back of the truck. Just in the bed of the truck? No, no, no. It's a, like a four-door truck. Oh. So he's it's in like the back of the truck with Isaac, and then Gandula's driving. Okay. So they drive north from Fort Lauderdale. They go up north a little bit to Isaac's house. Isaac takes... 
Camilio into this apartment. Gandula stays in the truck, but Gandula's putting two and two together that something's not right here and starts calling Vila, the exorcist, who's in Las Vegas training, just ignoring him. He doesn't answer the phone because he's training. He's busy. Right. I don't have time for this phone call. I'm busy. I'm very busy. At the same time, Isaac, the promoter, is trying to get a hold of Manny Marin because they're supposed to be meeting up right now. But where's Manny? He just left the stingrays. Yes, he's, he's still on his way back. Behind. He's still on the water. And earlier I said you should always interview the crew that you hire to go kill somebody to make sure you know how they're going to react when the plan doesn't go quite like the plan is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Someone needs to lead the operation. Yes. Isaac somewhat panics because he can't get a hold of Manny. So instead of just playing it cool and being like, well, let's just take some time and see, about every two to three minutes, he's making a phone call to Manny's phone. One after another, after another, after another. I could have 10 years of Manny Marin's phone records, and this day, this moment would glow like a bright would light. Would never equate to the other calls that he gets. You are never going to miss that. Okay, something is wrong. He's getting mandied. Yeah, yes, on the Harmon case, 100%. <laughs> At the same time, Gandula sitting in the truck outside, unsupervised, wanting to know from the exorcist, hey, what did you get me into? Because remember, it was the exorcist who introduced him to Isaac for this job. Mm -hmm. So he's blaming Vila 100%. Okay. So as this is happening, they sit there for a couple hours. <laughs> Finally, they bring Camilio back out okay. to the truck and they head north. And Gandula's still really uncomfortable with everything that's happening. They pull Was Camilio, was he hurt at all when they brought him back out nope, to the truck? not at this he point. Was, he's okay. just zip-tied up still. And they zip-tie his ankles too. And so his hands are zip-tied behind his back. His ankles are zip-tied So he's hopping along. Well, when they, I think when they get him in the truck to keep him from jumping out and trying to run. Uh -huh. So they go up north a little bit further. They're past the Fort Lauderdale airport or close to the Fort Lauderdale airport at this point. And they pull into this warehouse district. And they're just parked in this back shady parking lot. And there's a lot of shady parking lots. Well, there's a lot of shady warehouses throughout Fort Lauderdale. Yes. So they're parked in this shady little parking lot. And pretty soon, this little bluish Mercedes SUV pulls up. And Manny Marin steps out of the driver's seat. Camilio immediately recognizes, oh, shit, that's Jenny's husband. This is the business meeting he kissed Jenny for and took off. Yes, this is the business meeting. As soon as they pull that boat into Lighthouse Point, he jumps off the boat and he runs because he's got all these missed phone calls and he right. realizes, oh, crap, it's, yeah. it's on. It's a go. See you later, kids. But this isn't all that they see. Isaac gets out of the car to small talk with Manny. Hey, Manny, we're here. Blah, blah. Camilio is explaining again, Dula. I'm having an affair with this guy's wife. They're going to kill me. They're here to kill me. As he's explaining this, Manny opens the rear trunk, like the lid from the SUV, the, that big back door. The whole back area mm -hmm. is covered in plastic. <gasps> oh. It's like straight out of Sopranos type shit. Oh my gosh, Dexter. So at this point, you've got Gandula, the panther, in the mm -hmm. driver's seat. You've got Camilio in the back seat, all zip tied up. Okay. You've got Manny and Isaac at... Manny's car with the plastic ready to put him in there to hide any evidence. Gandula realizes this is going to be a homicide. They're going to kill this guy. He just wants out. So he wants Camilio out of the car. So he turns so around. He can leave. He cuts the, the little zip tie that's holding his ankle and tells him, run, get out. Camilio jumps out of the car, but Isaac and Manny are on him like that. So they capture him, put him in the back with the plastic, shut the lid. As this is happening, Gandula's like, screw it. I want nothing to do with this. And boom, takes off. He's driving home as fast as he can. And what's interesting with the phones is you see this, like you can actually see it happening, but I'll get to that here in a minute. So as Gandula's explaining the story, the detectives are like, holy shit, that changes everything. They have Manny Marin putting the victim into his car with plastic. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hours before his body is found burned and he's oh with Isaac. Gosh. So at this point, they're thinking, okay, we've got a pretty solid case. I have to wonder why Gandula didn't just drive off with Camilio in the car. What made him think that Camilio was actually going to get away if he just undid the zip ties around his ankles? Gandula is scared to death of Isaac. It's why? the Latin King connection. Oh. Remember, they're all from Cuba. That's true. And he believes that if he crosses the Latin Kings in that type of manner, like he can leave and everything's okay. But if he actually prevents this homicide of Manny Marin's target, this is something that he would probably be executed His for. main goal was just to get away from it all happening. And he is terrified, terrified of the Latin Kings. Okay. So he just wants out at this point. So he's going to run away. And the detectives are sitting there talking Crockett and Tubbs and the Bulldog. And they're thinking, well, that's a great story. Mm-hmm. We're never going to get him extradited. How do we get him back to the United States? 
Gail does something that I would say less than 1% of the prosecutors in the United States today would do. And? She makes a deal right then and there. What does she say? Get on a plane, fly back to Miami with us. I'll give you 36 months. And Gandula's so, like, sold. And off it was to the an airport. option. Yeah. So off to the airport they go. And Gandula, and he legitimately feels bad at this point. He's explaining, like, I feel responsible. I should have done more. He I actually didn't. has a moral compass. Yes, he does. And he feels bad. And he says this has been haunting him for years. So he consensually goes to the airport with him. They fly back to Miami. They book him. And he's going to take a plea deal for 36 months with the agreement that he testifies. But Crockett and Tubbs have their work in front of them. Now, this is mm -hmm. where the real work starts. It's a great story, right? It's, yeah. hey, that but sounds great. But they have great. to confirm everything that he said. Got to prove it. How, how is the defense going to tear his story apart, right? He just took this deal. How do we know he didn't kill anybody? Mm -hmm. The phone records are going to corroborate his story 100%. Like, they're really going to tell the story. That's where we're headed next. But I've got to get into a little bit of what we do with phone records and how we look at this. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this on a couple cases before, but we've talked about victimology. And the idea of victimology is we do significant research into a victim's history to understand who they have chance encounters with, who they have regular encounters with, what is their risk profile? Are they a very high risk where they're subjecting mm -hmm. themselves to all kinds of potential opportunities to be hurt? Are they very low risk? They never leave their house. And it's this victimology study, if you will. And a victimology report, just what you fill out, can be hundreds of pages. Like it covers everything from newspaper delivery to pizza delivery to what gym do you go to? Do you go to a regular car wash? Right? Mm -hmm. It gets pretty involved. What you do in your everyday life. Right. Well, when I really started getting into cell phone investigations, I noticed a lot of corresponding pieces between victimology and what phone records would show. Where if you do a really in-depth dive, and if people think about their cell phone, you have it with you all the time, those patterns start to come up Your to the top. cell phone use is, hab is as habitual as what time you eat every day. Right. And when I'm teaching this portion of a course to people, a lot of times I'll explain to them, if you think about it, how many people today still have an alarm clock? Like alarm clocks are out. And even when you have them, people don't use them anymore. You use your phone. Right. How many people, when your phone alarm goes off in the morning, you just jump out of bed, happy as can be, and take off running like my crazy wife? <laughs> Or do you take a little bit of time? Maybe you scroll through a little bit of Facebook, you catch some news reports, you check your text messages. Well, all that activity is logged. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily know what that specific activity is, but we start to see these patterns. We can see the way you drive to work, the route that you take, the route you take home, when you deviate, when you turn your phone off. Like right. all of that is out there. Well, and this is why you have to have probable cause under search warrant to be able to go after this information because Correct. it is such private information. We can learn so much about what you do every day to include doctors that you visit, right. to include everything. what kind of doctors you visit. Affairs that you're having. Right. It, it will tell you everything. And it's funny because I've seen a lot of comments on our YouTube page about people. Oh, so you're just spying on people. Yes. When you commit a crime... A heinous felony, we call it a homicide. When you commit <laughs> homicide and I can justify probable cause through a judge to get your phone records, I will spy on you. Like and that's this just... is the proper way to go about <laughs> looking at somebody's <laughs> phone records to include their location information and content. Correct. If you're doing an investigation appropriately. And I think at the same time, we have to address if you commit a heinous crime and you have your cell phone with you and you think that law enforcement won't look at your phone, it's not my fault you're dumb, right? I can't help that you're not seeing that this is something that's done every day in America. So yes, we spy on people legally with uh, search warrants. But it's funny, as I started getting more and more involved in these cases and realizing the power that the cell phone records have to solve cases to, you know, we've solved serial rape cases. We've solved serial homicide cases. You can do a lot of good with these records. I noticed the similarities between victimology and my cellular investigation. And I started calling it cellular demology. And you included this in your 40-hour training course. Yeah, it was just a word that I made up, cellular demology. Well, in Arizona, we have what's called defense interviews. Different case altogether for a second, just bear with me. And defense interviews, before I go testify in court, the defense attorney has the right to interview me, to question me about anything I may say in court. And they record it, a lot of times it's videotaped. And it's a little fresh run, if you will, for them to understand, okay, this is the issues I need to be willing to deal with. I had this jackass of a defense attorney, and I will not, I'm not gonna bring up names, very, very arrogant. And he started making fun of my education, my lack thereof education, and 
made it very clear that he thought I was a corrupt cop from the get-go, just talking down to me, demeaning the entire time, just not professional, just a complete ass clown. Okay. And while he's questioning me about these phone records, he's throwing out a lot of really technical questions. How many times did so-and-so call so-and-so? Well, how many times did they call back? Well, how many of those were text messages? Well, how many times of those 15 calls were they in this particular area? Mm -hmm. And as he's hitting me with these questions, I'm keeping up with him, no problem, like 14 26. Yes, they're in this area. And I've got my computer and I have an Excel program that I'm using that's got all this mashed up. And I'm using what's called a pivot table. Anybody who uses Excel, it's a pretty simple function in Excel. Mm -hmm. Well, he asked me at one point, hey, how did you memorize all this? I'm like, no, I'm using a pivot table. Are you Rain Man? Yeah, are you Rain Man? I'm like, no, I'm using a pivot table. It's right here. So I turn my computer around and I'm explaining it to him. He's like, well, where do I get the pivot table program? I'm like, it's it's Microsoft Excel. If you have Office, you have it. <laughs> the pivot table. And all of a yeah. sudden he starts getting really friendly and he's really nice. And he's telling me, oh, well, can you show me this? Can you show me that? And all of a sudden the dummy in the room, me, is uh -huh. teaching him how to look at this stuff. And I was cool with it. I'm like, yeah, here's how you do this. And I'm just dicking with him at this point because he's being such an ass up to this. Uh -huh. I'm like, yeah, it's just basic victimology and cellular homology. You know, if you've, if you've read anything on cellular homology, it's the same principle as victimology. Not wanting to acknowledge that he may not know something that I did, uh -huh. he agreed. He's like, oh, I have heard about cellular homology. And I'm thinking, you lying <laughs> sack of shit. No, you have not. But once he started going with it, I thought, well, I'm going to have fun with him at this point. And we talk about cellular homology for a solid 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. The interview ends months later. We're in court. And he starts off his cross-examination of me on the stand in court, sworn in. Detective Ray, I'd like to talk to you about the cellular homology that you use in this case. And I know it's a fake word. I don't want to admit that I've done anything <laughs> related to cellular homology. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, you mean the analysis of the cell phone record? He's like, yeah, the, the basic cellular homology that you did. And I won't, I won't acknowledge that because I don't want to use the word cellular homology. It's a fake word. I made it up. Right. And we go back and forth for, for a while. classes. And pretty soon he realizes hang on, and starts pushing me about where I got the word cellular homology, where I found out about cellular homology, where I've researched it, my training in cellular homology. Mm -hmm. And finally, I get to a point that I'm, I, the gig's up, right? And I have to tell him, I said, well, actually, sir, that it's a made-up word. I created the word cellular homology. I think it's a real approach to right. investigations, it but it's a fake word. Right. And he looked like a complete idiot now, right? Because for 20 minutes, he's been trying to sell to the judge that this is a <laughs> real thing, cellular homology. And he loses his mind in the courtroom. Luckily, it's a hearing, so there's no jury. But the judge is getting on me now a little bit, too. Like, hey, did you make up a word in the interview about serenomology? And Yes, Your Honor, I did that. Well, why would you do that? And I didn't know what to say to the judge. Okay. And the only thing that came out was, well, Your Honor, in the defense interview, he was being really mean to me. <laughs> And I just said it, and then he acted like he knew what I was talking about, and I know he didn't, and he was being such a jerk up to that point. I just had a little fun with him for a while because he was being mean. The judge actually kind of smiled, uh -huh. and he was like, enough. Continue. I don't want any more talk about serenomology. Go. And we just started the hearing again. You know, the interesting thing about this is that the word cellular demology actually is a word for something very real. It's almost, it reminds me of when there's a color that you can't identify a name for a specific color, but it's a really bright, interesting color, maybe that you just can't come up with the name of the color for. But eventually a color is named. Right. Right. So it's very similar to this concept of cellular demology. Somebody had to name what this part of the investigation is, and right. that was you. And now it's much more recognized. It, there are places I've been now where they're like, oh no, it's basic cellular demology. Mm -hmm. But this was the beginning of that whole thing. This is the early 2000s. Right. It was kind of funny. So cellular demology, that's what we're going to get into with this particular case and in getting into the phone records. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the case presentation. So we're moving on to court. They, they've they indicted everybody. Manny's still unknown. We don't know where Manny's at still. They're going to try to find. We'll get into that here in just a little bit. But we're going to trial on Isaac the thug okay. and Alexis the exorcist, right? Both of those are going to trial. And I've been working on the phone. So I'm going to testify in court on the phone pattern. And I'm going to use the actual courtroom presentation that I used. I'm going to just abbreviate it because it took about three hours on the stand to get through this. So this first part that you're going to see here is the different colors on the screen. And there's a little legend down at the bottom of the screen that says who's who. So we're going to start that morning, June 1st, and we see Isaac, who's purple, is going to drive across 
to pick up Gandula as a apartment, who's orange. And you actually see purple and orange come together. Okay. Then you see them drive back. And as they move back, you're going to see red come into the screen. And when red comes into the screen, that's going to be our victim, Camilio. And this is when they're watching him at his house. Eventually, he goes to the wife's office. And all of a sudden, you see purple and orange now traveling with red. So they're all traveling together. Mm-hmm. You're going to see him move up north to the apartment complex, and this is where for a couple hours they're sitting in the apartment complex, like Gandula explained. Eventually, around 1.45, 2 o'clock, you'll start to see some green popping up. And green is Manny Marin. He's way north up at Lighthouse Point. We can see when his yacht comes into Lighthouse Point because Isaac is just blowing up his phone nonstop. Right. And finally it connects, and we start to see these connections. Hmm. Very shortly after that, we'll see green start to travel down, and all the phones come together. So there's a little brief moment where you see green, orange, purple, and red. All red coming to the victim. same place. All coming to the same place. And this is what Gandula was describing as this meeting point where he saw the pl- plastic in the back of the SUV. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting there, it's the first big deviation, is when they all meet up, they're all together for a few minutes, and then you see Gandula's phone just p- squirt out the bottom, and it, it is a beeline back to his house. Okay. So he separates. There's no doubt he is no longer with Manny, Isaac, and the victim. Mm-hmm. Those three are going to slowly start moving to the west. And as soon as Gandula takes off from the group, his first phone call is to Vila. And I like to look at this with, when we're talking cellular etymology, you get into a car accident. You're alive. You're kind of beat up and banged up a little bit. Who's the first person you call? The person that you know is going to be there for you quickly. Who's the second person? Yeah. Right. The police. Right. So Gandula was calling Vila to figure out what the heck just happened. They're going to kill this guy. What you did you know? Tell me. Why did you allow me to do this? How did you get me set So up? he's upset. He's pissed. And it's like a 16-minute phone call. And these two don't have enough brain cells to talk for 16 minutes most of the time. So it stands out. Even when you look at their history, mm-hmm. they don't have 16-minute phone calls. So Vila didn't have any type of plan. Did Marin appoint anyone as the leader of this operation while it Isaac, was going I down? think, was the one that was really calling the shot. But Vila was coordinating things behind the scenes. Vila's the one that's getting everybody in place to do what they were going to do. And that's why Gandula's like... I did this for you. You asked me to do this, and that's why I did it. You never told me they're going to kill this guy. So what did Vila say to him? As long as you didn't hurt him and you keep your mouth shut, everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. Just go home. (gasps) He knows. He knows exactly what they're doing. Oh, poor Gandula. Yeah. But Vila's not innocent is the point here. And I'll get to more with Vila as we we get through the cell phones. At this point, we see the three phones with the victim moving out towards Okeechobee Road. Mm -hmm. Now, dumb criminals. There's also this thing in Florida called Sun Pass. That's their toll. Their toll booth. System. And it's on every freeway, every exit. When you get off of the freeways, you pass a Sun Pass camera that takes a picture of your license plate. Mm -hmm. So when you are Manny Marin driving your Mercedes that's registered to you, and you get off the freeway at Okeechobee, it's going to capture the date and time with the picture of the license plate of when that happened. Right. I can't remember. In Florida, do they also take the driver's picture? They do. These didn't, the, it's too far back, so they're not going to get the driver's picture. By the time they figured out, those pictures are no longer available, but they get the license plate. Okay. But Manny gets off the freeway on Okeechobee Road just before the fire, and it tracks perfectly with the cell phone, so it helps corroborate the location accuracy that we're seeing with the cell phone records. Mm-hmm. Shortly after that, they're out on Okeechobee Road. No fire yet. Another sun pass. They're southbound. They drive for about 15 minutes. They drive out west. They get really close to the Miami International Airport. And then all of a sudden, they get off the freeway. Another sun pass. Okay. They stop at a gas station. Sound familiar? Seisman and Amani. Seisman and Amani. Date night. Mm. They stop at a gas station. And then they get back on the freeway. Another sun pass. They drive back to the crime scene. More sun passes. And about 10 minutes after they get to the crime scene for the second time is when the detective that's working the narcotics interdiction sees the fire. They left, decided they should probably burn the victim to probably try to conceal some evidence. And they got got gas and they drove back there. And and Manny Marin was probably thinking to himself, no one thought to get gas. (laughs) Right. Such a simple plan. Right. 
when they leave this next time, you see the phone again leave and it's going to go south, but this time they're going to Gandula's apartment. Gandula's got the rental truck. <laughs> That's in Isaac's name. Right. So he took off and left. So they got to go get the rental truck. So they get to Gandula's house and Isaac comes to his door to get the keys for the rental truck. Gandula says he noticed that Isaac smelled like gasoline, like a distinct odor of gasoline. Mm. Isaac tells Gandula, if you would have stayed, Manny would have paid you $20,000 but you didn't, so you get nothing. You better keep your mouth shut. Takes the keys and leaves. The thing that happens next is probably one of the most significant pieces of this entire case. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Manny Marin at the time, he must have just been seeing red so bad. Yeah. He had no concept what he was doing. The heat of passion. As they're leaving Gandula's apartment, you see Isaac and Manny Marin's phone starting to go north again. And all of a sudden, the victim's phone, Camillo, lights up with them. They still had his phone in their truck. They still have the phone. And there's two or three little bits of connection. And you can see Camillo's phone is now traveling with Manny Marin. When you look at the history of that phone, he's checking voicemails. He's looking at the text messages. He wants to see. He can't take it. And at this point, the homicide was brutal. They tortured. Wait, he was checking. What, what was he wanting to see exactly? Did Jenny call? Right. Did Jenny leave a message? Did Jenny have text messages to Camillo? He wants to see what is his wife saying to this guy. And this homicide, by the way, brutal. They mm -hmm. tortured Camillo. They didn't just take him out in the swamp and kill him. They beat him severely. He had major, major facial fractures. Okay. They end up cutting his neck twice and not just a little cut, like ear to ear, uh -huh. pretty much removing most of his head. They... They butchered this poor guy, and then they light him on fire. Uh, most of the fire was condensed around his growing area again. This sounds which familiar. It's kind of sending a message, right? So extremely brutal homicide, and then they, they all go home. Interesting. We've got some challenges in court that we've got to overcome here. One of the things with cellular homology is, okay, sure, there's 51 calls on June 1st between Isaac and Marin, but for me to go into court and testify, well, is that normal? Maybe they're just really good friends and chitty chatty all day. Right. So I had to go back and I had to look at all of the calls I could find in their records. In total, in January 1st of 2011 through May 31st, so almost six months, right? A day shy of six months. There was 51 contacts just on June 1st, 63 for the entire period of that six months. So essentially there's 12 contacts that they have for six months and then they have 51 on one day. Wow. So now I can go into court and, and say, not only is this weird, but this is why it's I can say- It's not within their normal completely pattern of behavior. outside the pattern. When I did go back and look at those 12 calls that happened outside of June 1st, what was really interesting, and I've got some graphics that I'll, I'll throw up for those of you on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on just a regular podcast, it probably might be interesting to, to jump to YouTube, scroll to the end so you can see some of this. For that six month period, so between January 1st of 2011, they don't talk. Isaac and Marin. They just, okay. they don't talk. On the 15th of May is the first time we see some communication before them. And then it slowly ramps up over the next several days to where it blows up on June 1st. But that first call that appears that something's happening between them is on the 15th. Well, if we break down the 15th, some really interesting things happen. We see that Vila calls Marin on the 15th and he's actually returning a voicemail. Okay. So Vila calls Marin, and that happens at 7.52 p.m. As soon as Vila hangs up with Manny Marin, he immediately calls Isaac, the promoter. That happens at 7.55. As soon as he hangs up with Isaac, Isaac calls Marin. So you see Vila, hey boss, I got this set up. We're going to use Isaac. Hangs up. Hey Isaac, I need you to call Manny. This thing's a go. You guys get it set up. Let me know what you need. Isaac then calls Manny. I'm all in. W what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And this is where the plan gets gets hatched. Okay. When they hang up, Isaac and Manny, Isaac immediately calls Vila back. We're a go. I need that third person, though. As soon as they hang up, Vila calls Gandula. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the phone records, you have none of this activity for five and a half months. And then you can literally see in a 30-minute section everything getting planned out. I want to talk a little bit about something that happened leading up to court and something I saw on court TV because it just it needs to be explained a little better. Okay. I was watching this piece on Court TV about this case, and they had these two analysts that were commenting that they couldn't believe that this case was actually going to trial. And it's an example of somebody with money, Manny Marin, 
thinking that he can just hire and pay his way out of being responsible or held responsible for this crime. They thought it was just ridiculous that Manny Marin wouldn't take a plea deal. What they don't realize is this Gil, case. the bulldog Levine, yeah. has a policy. You take a life, you serve a life. Mm. Manny Marin wanted a plea deal. Manny Marin, at one point, I think there was a plea deal on the table for 20 years. He's 67 at the time. He would get, get out until he's 87 years old. So there's this 20-year plea deal on the table. The bulldog's like, no, you won't plead to 20 years. You take a life, you serve a life. That's the rule. So she completely went for life in prison. Yes. She wouldn't allow him to plead. Yeah. And I just saw this getting twisted because obviously these analysts have no idea what's going on behind the scenes, but it's just a reminder to our audience. You'll hear things on TV. You'll hear these really coveted analysts or contributors on these certain talk shows. Like they know what they're talking about. There's so many dynamics behind the scene on these cases. They have no idea. Like at no point did they know, oh no, Gail Levine ain't putting up with nobody's nonsense. Right. You take a life, you Or serve this guy's just so cocky and wealthy that he is too egotistical to take a plea. Right. And like I said before, Vila is in Vegas. So how do we convict Vila of the conspiracy here? And it was pretty clear through Gandula's testimony. Gandula did this because of Vila. Vila and Isaac set the entire thing up. You see the phone calls. Vila didn't kill anybody but he was part of the conspiracy that caused the victim's death. An accomplice in a way. Yes, and that is what he went for, was the conspiracy to commit murder. And he is convicted for that. And it showed really clearly when we went through the court hearing of his involvement on that piece. He's gonna end up with 15 years in prison because wow. he didn't kill anybody, but he committed that conspiracy. Remember, he did three years after the uh, the Southwest ticket desk <laughs> right. issue as well. So he's going back to prison a second time. <sighs> Roberto Isaac, who I believe is probably the most responsible, maybe the guy who actually committed the murder, although it wouldn't surprise me if Manny had a piece of that. We'll never know because they're not talking. Mm -hmm. Roberto was going to take one for the team here. He admitted he did the murder because he was trying to get everybody else off at this point. He's going to get life in prison. So Roberto's never getting out of prison. Gandula did his three years. He's out. He's off yeah. to his own. He did testify that on the stand he felt really bad because he realized he could have stopped this. He could have called 911. He justifies it at the time he was just terrified of the Latin Kings. And if he did that, he felt like he would have been killed. It is what it is on that one. Mm -hmm. Now we got to talk just a little bit about Marin to wrap this thing up. Remember, Marin fled. And eventually law enforcement's going to find out he has a villa in Spain. Oh. So he fled to Spain, living life in Spain. He and Jenny actually end up with a divorce. Part of the divorce is that she doesn't talk poorly about him in front of the kids and uh, comes to Spain once in a while with the kids so that they can visit. Uh -huh. The bulldog finds out about this and she starts digging into it with Crockett and Tubbs. And what they find out is one of his sons from his first marriage is taking over the family business and using proceeds from the business to support Manny over in Spain. And she does a pretty big power move right here. She puts a case together that says he's a known wanted fugitive. His only ability to survive in Spain right now is the fact that you guys are paying and sending him money. You are facilitating a fugitive to be a fugitive, which oh. is technically a crime. Yes. And she goes and arrests him, brings him in front of a grand jury. Like she makes a spectacle of it with the idea of, hey, dad, you want to hide behind Spain? Let me show you what I can do to your son here. And it works. Manny immediately turns himself in. Do we know where in Spain he was living? Not that it matters, but... I remember curious. hearing it once, but I can't recall. Whereas I'm sure it was pretty nice. Like Manny was still pretty well off. Yeah. So they're going to eventually extradite Manny from Spain. He turns himself in. He comes to trial. His trial was second. We actually had the trial on Isaac and Vila first. And then the second trial, we had to go back and do it all over again. Gail had actually retired by the second trial. Uh, trial and it was taken over by her predecessor, if you will, Justin. And Justin did an amazing job too. He's just as as thorough as Gail was. Absolutely knocked this one out of the park. And mm -hmm. Marin will end up getting life in prison as well, uh, both without the possibility of parole. And Jenny's just happy as a clam. Um, I saw Jenny's testimony in Marin's trial, and it was sad. Mm -hmm. I think she feels largely responsible yeah. for all this that went down. Of course, you have the victim's wife in the courtroom at the same time. Daisy. So Daisy and Jenny are kind of testifying back to back, mm -hmm. telling two totally different stories, of course. How it's, horrible for Daisy. Daisy's definitely one of the primary victims here. Daisy will file a wrongful death lawsuit, a civil suit against the Marin estate, if you will. And I don't know the specific details of how that played out. I know she did all right in it. She, she got compensated. Good. Although, you know, arguably 
can't ever replace all that. But at the same time, just that horror of not only does all this happen, but it happens because your husband's having an affair. Like, right. uh, and he knew that her husband had knowledge of the affair and had already threatened him. If you continue this, I'm going to kill you. He already had fair warning. Of yeah. It. Like that's got to be so hard to digest as a mom, especially a mom with two young children that young. Ugh. Yeah. Mm. Ugh. So yeah, no happy endings here. Everybody's just a freaking mess. Contrary to Jorge's uh, pleas, Vila has not been freed. He's got a few more years to go. Maybe he's training again. Maybe he's going to come out and be uh, the next UFC champion. How old would he be? Pretty old. <laughs> he'd, he'd definitely be in the <laughs> Maybe senior Maybe he'll league. be a trainer. Yeah, he'd be in the senior league. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he'll be 55, maybe 56 by the time he gets out. Mm. So, yeah, pretty old. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what time does to him in prison. Yeah. So that's it. That is the real Miami Vice case. Thank you for joining us. Please come back next week for A Shooting Gone South. <laughs>